Okay, boys and girls, we're going to read a little bit more today. Did families live in big houses? When more and more children were born, the family needed more and more space, so they built more rooms. No matter how big the house was, the family still used the keeping room for cooking, eating, sleeping, and working. Remember, the keeping room was the big room in the center. We talked about that yesterday. One room called the keeping room. That's where they cooked, they ate, they worked. Grown-ups and the baby slept, and then the older children slept up in the attic. Remember that room we talked about yesterday? Okay. So it said when more and more children were born, the family needed more and more space, so they built more rooms. No matter how big the house was, the family still used the keeping room for cooking, eating, sleeping, and working. There were many kinds of houses. One kind of house looked like the box in which salt was kept in colonial days. It is still called a salt box house today. What did the furniture look like? Most people had plain furniture. They made it themselves. They didn't make much furniture because there was not much room to put it in. In many houses, there was only one chair. It belonged to the father. No one else was allowed to sit in it. The rest of the family sat on wooden benches, or they sat on the settle. The settle was a long wooden bench with high sides and a high back. It was not comfortable, but at least it was warm in winter. The high sides and the high back kept out the chilling winds that blew through the house. What did people sleep on? Mothers and fathers slept in a jack bed. The jack bed was short to save space. Mothers and fathers did not sleep stretched out. The bed was not long enough. The jack bed was high so that a smaller bed for the younger child could fit under it. The smaller bed was called a trundle bed. At night, the trundle bed was pulled out from under the jack bed. Babies slept in their cradles near the fireplace. Older children slept in the attic on bags filled with scratchy straw or on a softer mattresses filled with feathers or bits of wool. Where did people hang their clothes? People hung their clothes on pegs on the wall. So it sounds like they didn't have dressers, did they? Or, or chest of drawers, they just hung their clothes on pegs on the wall. Where did people take baths? There were no bathrooms in a colonial house. There was no running water either. So where do you think they went to the bathroom out? Mm-hmm, outside, that's right. People had to go outside their house for their water. They carried their water from their home from the well in wooden buckets. There was no way to make sure that the water was pure, so they did not often drink it. They did not often bathe in it either. When they did take a bath, they stood up in a big wooden tub of water in front of the fireplace. The people work hard in colonial days. People had to work hard in colonial days. They had to because almost everything they used, they because almost everything they used, they made themselves. Think of the clothes the people wore. There was spinning and weaving and knitting to be done. The spinning wheels and looms were homemade too. Think of the food they ate. There were gardens to weed, rows and rows of corn to hoe, food to cook, bread to bake, butter to churn. No end to work. Think of the dishes they used. There were trenches and bowls and spoons and mugs to make. Think of the houses they lived in. There were beds and tables and chairs and brooms and buckets and barrels to make. And when those things got broken, they had to be fixed. Making soap and making candles took more than a day. Sometimes neighbors came to help and the jobs went faster. When did the boys and girls work? But boys and girls were taught that work was good for them. In colonial days, people thought it was a sin to be lazy. So every morning, the children got up early and helped with the work. Boys worked before school, after school, and at night. Girls worked just as hard. Did children have any time to play? No matter how hard people worked, they always found some time to play. Colonial children did not have as much time to play as you do, but when they did play, they had just as much fun. They played some of the games that you play today. They played tag and blind man's buff. They sang and played, here we go, around the mulberry bush, and London Bridge is falling down. What games did boys like? 
Most of all, boys liked to play ball. They played with a leather ball filled with feathers. Boys had tops to spin, drums to bang, pop guns to pop. They had hoops to roll, marbles to shoot, kites to fly. They had trees to climb and icy ponds to skate on. Their skates were made with wooden runners. What group do girls like to do? Colonial girls played mostly with dolls. Their dolls were made of rags and corn husks. Some girls had wooden dolls. These dolls were not meant to be playthings. They were really fashion dolls. In big towns like Boston, the dolls were put in shop windows. When a wooden doll got too old to be used in a shop window, it was given away to some lucky girl. Girls sewed samplers. With tiny stitches, they made birds and trees and flowers and the letters of the alphabet. Girls made up mottos for their samplers like this one. And that's what it looks like down there. And it says, there's the ABCs. It says, this is my sampler. Here you see what care my mother took of me. Tiny stitches with a needle and thread. Were there special days just for fun? Sometimes when crops were good and everybody had plenty to eat, the people had a holiday. They set aside a special day to thank God for their good harvest. On that day, there was feasting and there was fun. Sometimes, too, many families got together to help build a neighbor's house. When the house was finished, the people had a party to celebrate. In many towns, a training day was held once a month. Men and boys ran races, held fighting matches, and took part in shooting contests. Prizes were given to the winners. Were there special laws about fun? In wintertime, coasting down snowy hills on sleds was against the law. Sledding was said to be a waste of time. In the summer, in some towns, swimming was against the law. Swimming was said to be a waste of time, too. Ministers gave long sermons about dancing. They said dancing was a sin, but their sermons did no good. People danced anyway. And in the large towns, dancing teachers gave lessons to children. The people travel much in colonial days. No one in colonial days traveled just for fun. There was no easy way to travel. There were no buses, no cars, no trains, no planes, but there were wagons and horses and oxen and boats. Boats were the best way to go. Land travel was slow going. It was rough going too. Roads were narrow and bumpy and full of holes. When it rained, the roads were muddy. When it didn't rain, the roads were dusty. And in the winter, the roads were icy. Roads in the early colonial days were really Indian trails. They were so narrow that people could not walk side by side. How did people get across the water? On a horse, on a bridge of stone or wood, on a log, most bridges were log bridges. It was easier for a Native American to walk across a log bridge. It was, they were used to it. But a colonial man was not, and so he might find himself off the bridge and in the water. How did people travel when there was snow on the ground? They traveled by a pod or a pung. A pod was a sleigh pulled by one horse. A pung was a sleigh pulled by two horses. People liked to travel in the snow. The snow filled in the holes in the road. The wooden runners of the pods and the pungs went easily over the snow. A trip might take a whole day or longer. So travelers took their supper with them and they took a pot full of burning coals to cook it. They tied a a big thing of frozen bean porridge to the back of the sleigh. Whenever they got hungry, they chopped off a piece of porridge with their axes. How did two men travel when they had only one horse? Suppose there were two men and one horse. One man was William and the other man was John. They wanted to get to the next town, but the horse was not strong enough to carry William and John at the same time. How did they travel without riding the horse together? The two men started out at the same time. William rode the horse while John walked. William rode for a few miles. Then he got off and walked. He left the horse tied to a tree. John came along. He got on the horse and rode past walking William. After a few miles, John got off the horse and tied it to a tree. John and William took turns walking. They took turns riding and tying the horse. This was a way of traveling called riding and tying. John did not get tired, neither did William, neither did the horse. Does that sound pretty smart to you all? I think it does too. How did people get the news? Most towns had a town crier. His job was to walk through the streets and call out the news of the day. If the town crier had a special news to tell, he rang a bell or banged on a drum. Then people ran to hear what he was saying. Another way to hear the news was to go to the village inn. Travelers from other colonies told what was going on in their towns. There were only a few news 
papers in the early colonial days. The papers printed news of the 13 colonies. There was news about what ships were sailing and what cargo the ships carried. The papers also have poems, sermons, and advertisements. How would you write a letter in colonial days? Suppose your father was away from home and you wanted to write to him. How would you begin your letter? You would never write, dear dad. That wouldn't be polite. You would say, dear sir or honored sir. You would end the letter this way. I am with greatest respect, dear father, your dutiful son or your dutiful daughter. So things were different back then, weren't they? What would you use for a pen and ink and envelope? You would write with a goose feather or a feather from a wild turkey. This was called a quill pen. Maple bark boiled in water made good ink. To dry the ink, you would sprinkle sand over the page. There were no envelopes, so you would fold the letter. You would seal the folds with a blob of hot sealing wax. Houses and streets had no numbers, so you might write the address like this. To Mr. William Bradgood, near the White Horse Inn in Cow Street, Boston. <laughs> That's funny, isn't it? No addresses. How would you send your letter? Suppose you wanted to send your letter to someone in another colony. You would have to pay a man to deliver it. There is no regular mail service in early colonial days. So you have to pay somebody to hop on his horse or go walk and take it for you. How long... To, did it take to deliver a letter? Sometimes it took the man a month to deliver a letter. In the winter time, the roads were bad. Then it took two months. Sometimes the letter was never delivered. The man you hired might be killed by a Native American or someone else, or his mailbag might fall into the river. That would be the end of your letter. Sometimes it was easier and faster to just send a letter to England than to send a letter to another colony. Sailing ships carried the mail to England in about four weeks. When did the mail service get better? The first regular mail service began in 1672. 52 years after the pilgrims landed in Plymouth Rock, the mail was carried by men on horseback. The men were called post riders. The post rider rode with the mail through forests, along narrow Indian trails, and across streams. He kept his gun loaded. There might be a hungry bear or a wolf nearby or an unfriendly Indian. When the towns grew bigger, the roads became better. Then the mail was delivered by stage wagon. Travelers rode in the stage wagon too. When the wagon came to a big hill, the stage driver made all the passengers get out. They had to push the wagon up the hill. Who were the workers in a colonial town? The cobbler. I don't think they're talking about cobbler you eat, do they? Are they? People in colonial days walked more than people do today, so they wore out their shoes faster. There was always work for the town cobbler. He mended old shoes. That's what a cobbler is, and he made new shoes. No one had to worry about left shoes and right shoes. The cobbler made all shoes exactly alike. So a cobbler is someone who works on shoes. Not talking about peach cobbler, or strawberry, or raspberry, or blackberry. A cobbler works on shoes. All right, we're gonna learn some of the other jobs tomorrow. What other jobs they had. All right, so now, for your thing that you are doing with your parents today. You are listening to, hope that you listen to the recording of um, the Boston Tea Party. I love that story. If I were with you guys, I would have so much fun. I love listening to that story about the Boston Tea Party. Um, and um, having your parents read aloud or listen to the link that I've sent you. And then discussing with your parents what was the colonists' next plan for solving the problem with the British king. Did everyone agree on what should be done? That's what you're talking to your parents about. And then the word of the day is harbor. A harbor is a protected body of water that is deep enough for ships to set anchor. A harbor has port facilities where ships load and unload goods and so that's what where the boston tea party happened was at a harbor okay so i hope you guys are doing good remember if you have questions um have your parents send them to me i'm happy to try to answer those um 
we'll stay connected. So keep working. You guys are doing awesome. I miss you. All right, see you later. Bye.